I'm Canon John DeNero, Director of St. Anne and the Holy Trinity Church, and I want to welcome you to today's presentation, which we're calling Slavery at St. Anne and the Holy Trinity Church. Father Craig Townsend will lead this presentation. That's all right. And he will be joined oh, by uh, six students, five, I believe, with us, and one in who is presentations recorded, all seniors. No. And, no, two seniors, four juniors. Two seniors and four juniors at St. Anne's School. We're very grateful to you, Father Craig, and very grateful to all of you students who are participating today. And without any further ado, I turn this over to you, Father Craig. Great. Thank you, John. The national leadership of the Episcopal Church has twice in the past 15 years called on all Episcopal congregations to explore whether they had a history of complicity in the institution of slavery and of deriving economic benefits from that institution. This has taken on a new urgency here at St. Anne and the Holy Trinity Church. If we wish to participate credibly as a congregation in ongoing racial justice movements, we need to begin with an awareness of our own historic participation in the foundations of racial injustice. And to that end, I undertook this academic year to research the earliest years of the two original congregations, St. Anne's Church, founded in 1784 when slavery was still legal in this state, and Church of the Holy Trinity, founded in 1847, 20 years after slavery finally ended in New York. To determine the extent to which the parishes were involved with slavery and slavery produced commodities, cotton, sugar, tobacco, hemp, etc. So as, as we've mentioned, two seniors and four juniors at St. Anne's School have done this research with me, earning academic credit, yay. We began with a 19th century history of St. Anne's and a 20th century history of Holy Trinity that provided us with names of some of the earliest members and leaders of the two congregations. In pursuing information about those individuals, we made particular use of John Jay College's New York Slavery Records Index, an amazing online database. These high schoolers also uncovered an array of both 19th century and contemporary resources that have been extremely fruitful for our work. To sum up an overall picture, 22 of 30 known early leaders of St. Anne's Church, and a good deal more members or persons otherwise connected to the parish, were slaveholders. 22 of 30 early leaders of St. Anne's Church were slaveholders. Several were families for whom the streets in Brooklyn Heights and surrounding neighborhoods were named. Most enslaved between one and four persons. In addition, 10 of 15 St. Anne's leaders that we are able to lo locate in the years after slavery had ended in New York, very likely were deriving profits from slavery re related businesses, while the same is most likely true of 12 of the 24 earliest vestry and warden members at Holy Trinity Church prior to the Civil War. Such involvement ranges from being directors of banks and insurance companies that invested in slavery produced commodities and likely even provided loans for the enslavement of persons in the South, to being sellers of those commodities in this city, such as dry goods stores, to warehousing and otherwise actively participating in the national and international trade in such commodities. Donations by all of these persons were fundamental to the founding and early economic well being of the two churches which means that the histories of both congregations are stained with direct connections to the institution of slavery. And while it is clear that slaveholding was not by any means universal in these congregations, our reading of recent work on the economic history of slavery leads us to believe that no one living in Brooklyn or New York City in the post-revolution and antebellum periods can be said to have escaped this connection as slavery and its products worm their way into every aspect of the lives of these populations. Our purpose today is to present some of our findings. Each student will look at the story of one person or family connected to these parishes and then use that story to address a wider contextual issue. So they have all done extraordinary work. And to start us off, Sammy. Hi, um, my name is Sammy and I'll be talking about Aquila Giles and the Revolutionary War ideals. Um, can you see the pictures? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Um, so this is just some context. This is Aquila Giles, two pictures of him. Um, so he served as an original trustee of St. Anne's Church in 1787. So he provided some of the funding that was, able, that was required to found the church um, and he enslaved three people. He also had a deep involvement with the Revolutionary War and the ideals of the American, of the American founding. Um, so Giles was born in 1758 to an elite Maryland family, which included most notably his maternal grandfather, Governor William Packa of Maryland, um, and his extended family owned many people and acres. So when Giles' half-brother Nathaniel died in 1775, the will instructed that all nine of his slaves should be freed and that any heirs who attempted to retain them would be disinherited completely. So there was a clear conflict between um, kind of a, a despising for slavery, I think, in his family and obviously clear economic gain and exploitation. And this contradiction between the high ideals of the revolution and the economic gain to be extracted from enslaved labor would appear later in Giles' life too. So after joining the Continental Army from his home colony at the outbreak of conflict, he eventually fought in Pennsylvania as an officer. And in 1778, he was captured in Germantown by the British Army and paroled in New York, where he and several other Patriot officers um, were kind of put up with a Dutch family. And there are some pretty funny descriptions of how they hated the Dutch food and the way that the Dutch family treated them, but I won't go into that for the sake of time. Um, but while in New York, Giles met the English born Elizabeth Shipton, whom he married in 1780, just before his release. And Shipton's uncle and sort of surrogate father, he had kind of adopted her by this point, was the wealthy West Indies trader, William Axel, who was a former Colonel in the Long Island Loyalists and owned two homes in the New York area. Axtell was turned from the rebellion to the Loyalist cause following a British sweeping over his larger property in Flatbush during the Battle of Brooklyn. And it seems like he got scared into or got impressed into um, the British side. And it was this property, Melrose Hall, that Axtell had promised to his niece before she married Giles and that he subsequently withheld after, after she married him. Um, and it's pretty unclear how this affected Shipton, but it obviously graded on Giles. Um, he can't have been in serious need of money. He was a founding trustee of St. Anne's Church, so he clearly had a lot of money um, to spend, but his righteous anger may well have resulted from his service in the Revolutionary War. Um, and the powerful friends that Giles enlisted in his effort certainly support this connection. So in an August 1783 letter to George Washington, Giles professed, quote, a thorough conviction that it is your excellency's great desire to see that justice done to every officer of your army which you have ever administered to them since they have had the honor of being under your command. He described his disagreement with Axtell and accurately predicted that the loyalists would soon return to England and asserted that, quote, our differences of political sentiments were without doubt his reason for denying the property. And he concluded by reminding Washington of, quote, my having served my country faithfully for near eight years. Ultimately, the New York State Legislature confiscated and resold the property to Giles with the assistance of Treasury Secretary and fellow Revolutionary War veteran, Alexander Hamilton. Giles's opinion on slavery and its philosophical issues is not obvious, but certain clues might approximate his thinking. So on the relationship between slavery and the revolutionary ideals of liberty and equality, the New York Manumission Society offers a pretty good clue. John Jay, the founding president of the society, still owned one slave when Giles joined in 1810 um, and slaveholding was actually very common practice among prominent members, many of whom were also distinguished veterans of the revolution and the framing of the United States. With the notable exception of Hamilton, most members did not view the owning of slaves as a conflict with their stated values. Rather, the mission of the society was conceived less as a narrow anti-slavery effort and more as a broad guardianship over both enslaved and free black New Yorkers. So it was, it was kind of a paternalistic and condescending approach rather than an abolitionist one. And it's likely that Giles adopted this contorted interpretation of his role, but it's unclear. Property rights were another component of the revolutionary ideals, and they obviously pose another philosophical dilemma for early Americans involved in slavery. At issue were two competing forms of these rights. One was the right to own property, which many early Americans defined to include the right to own humans. And the other one was the right to own oneself, which would support the right of slaves to own themselves and therefore not be owned by someone else. Um, the disagreement between American and British negotiators after the revolution illustrates the dilemma as each party asserted a different conception of property rights. The British argued that the enslaved people whom they had helped evacuate from the, from the colonies were people 
and therefore had the right to self-ownership. The Americans, by contrast, argued that the evacuees were property and subject to return because of their owner's right to property. Giles likely took the latter view as he owned slaves and also fought in the revolution, so he would have been on the American side of that. Giles served as Marshal of New York from 1792 until Thomas Jefferson fired him in the early years of his administration, and Jefferson called him a most violent party man and accused him of packing grand juries. Um, it's unclear, the veracity of those claims is unclear, but he made them anyway. After his expulsion from government, Giles entered the, mili the militia and rose to the rank of Brigadier General. In 1813, he wrote to yet another Revolutionary War veteran, Secretary of State James Monroe, to request command of a regiment engaged in the defense of New York City. Finally, as his economic prospects worsened at the end of his life, Giles continued his relationship to the war and his work as a U.S. Army storekeeper. He and Shipton, his wife, both died in 1822. Great, thank you, Sammy. Uh, I am now going to uh, share screen uh, a video of uh, Bevan, and he'll tell you what he's up to. So let me make this happen. Please give me a wave if for any reason this doesn't work. One of the early fans. Oh, here we go. Hi, I'm Bevan, and I'm speaking on the mid of and Christianity and Slavery. One of the early families of Brooklyn, John and Sarah mid lived on Fulton and Henry Street. In 1784, the Episcopal congregation that would become St. Anne's Church moved from the living room of the Sands family to the mid barn. In the list of St. Anne's communicants in the 1845 history, Sarah mid is listed as the first member after the parish was finally incorporated in 1788. This established the mid as founding members of St. Anne's. They are also listed in an 1810 New York State Census as owning four slaves. This presents a common question to reflect on Christian churches at the time. How could Christians morally justify the enslavement of other people? Given biblical stories like Exodus, where God, through Moses, guides the Israelites out of slavery, one would assume the Bible speaks against slavery. This is not the case, and instead the reality is that many of these Christian enslavers base their justifications of slavery in the fact that the Bible never advocates against slavery. For example, the Ten Commandments, written by God, mention slavery twice, Exodus chapter 20, verse 10, 17. In the book of Ephesians, Paul specifically commands the slaves to obey their masters, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Another common justification for slavery was that it brings heathens to a Christian land where they can hear the gospel and where Christian masters provide religious instruction for their slaves. This suggests that the enslavers saw slavery as something that was charitable and something necessary to better the world. The late 18th century also had figures like John Jay, who established himself as a public anti-slavery proponent and advocated for the freedom of enslaved people, all while owning slaves himself. The grounds for his ideas, however, did not stem from theology, but from the revolution. His reasoning was based on the famous call for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In the 1830s, however, Christians across America's North began to entertain anti-slavery ideolo ideologies. Most notably, the American Anti-Slavery Society, led by William Lloyd Garrison and Arthur and Lewis Tappan. This movement centered itself in the church due to the platform that it could get from the institution but it also represented growing evangelical Protestant beliefs that slavery was in fact a sin. This idea was predominantly based on three ideas, the first being an assumption that every human should be able to work towards their own salvation, and that anything in the way of that is a sin. The second idea was based on the need to be benevolent. This suggests that one should be concerned for another's wellness, and that any action that results in another's detriment is sinful as well. Finally, evangelical Protestants sought an idea of perfection based in oneself. However, it states that one cannot be perfect unless society is perfect. Slavery stands in opposition to all of these ideas. This is what led many Christians to begin to adopt anti-slavery ideals. Despite this introduction of anti-slavery, many members of St. Anne and Holy Trinity Church profited from slavery past emancipation by working in industries that sold slave-produced products like cotton, tobacco, hemp, and others. Next up, Jolene. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jolene and I'll be talking about 
the comparison between slavery in the North and in the South throughout the 18th and 19th century, and also about the Hicks family. Um, so first, I want to talk a bit about slavery in the North versus slavery in the South. Um, and this topic is really relevant to our research because A, um, it's important not to fall into the trope of harsh slavery as like just a Southern thing. Um, also, B, the wealth of many early members of St. Anne's Church was made possible by the success of slave labor in the South. Um, and C, it's impossible to consider how the slave trade worked in the North without acknowledging um, the interdependency between slavery in the North and in the South. So despite the common misconception that slavery in the North was benign relative to slavery in the South, um, many records show that this was not always the case. Um, slaves in the North were often housed in unheated attics, uh, basements, outbuildings, and barns. Um, and they lived under a system of black codes, uh, which were based on the assumption uh, that black folks were dangerous in groups. Um, also the custom of separating families was common in the North, just as it was in the South. Um, advertisements for runaway slaves in New York would often mention that the slave in question may have gone to uh, find wives who were sold to distant purchasers. Um, in addition, slave were slaves were actually auctioned openly um, all throughout the North, um, specifically in the market house of Philadelphia, um, in the shadow of congregational churches in Rhode Island, um, in Boston taverns and warehouses, and weekly um, or sometimes daily, um, in the Merchant's Coffee House of New York, which is on the southeast corner of Wall and Water Streets. Um, it's also important to note that slavery in New York carried on well past uh, official legal emancipation. So the Gradual Emancipation Act freed enslaved children born after July 4th, 1799, but actually indentured them until they were young adults. Um, so in reality, slavery actually carried on until 1827 in New York. Um, and this is why many members of St. Anne's are still listed as owning slaves in 1800 and 1810 and um, even 1820 in some cases. Um, and also New York was not alone. Um, in fact, in New Jersey, there are records of 18 enslaved people um, as late as 1860, um, though they were officially termed apprentices for life. Um, slavery in the North was also, of course, closely tied to slavery in the South. Um, so you might know that Southern plantations provided Northern textiles with cotton. Um, however, the interdependency actually went even beyond this. Um, many banks in New York were committed to the expansion of slavery um, because the slave trade was crucial in the westward movement of investment. Um, I will note that there were some key differences between slavery in the North versus in the South, um, specifically that pertain to all research. Um, so whereas slaves in the South usually worked on plantations, um, in the North, many households enslaved smaller numbers uh, for domestic work, like between one and three slaves. Um, and this often meant arduous, lonely labor. And this was presumably, presumably sorry, the case um, with members of St. Anne's, many of whom had between one and seven slaves. Um, so in general, in New York City, slaves played key roles in the economic and social order um, and directly influenced the wealth and power of leading residents, such as those who came up during our research of slave owners connected to St. Anne's Church. Um, so I also wanted to share a bit about a family who was the focus of a lot of my research this past year, um, which is the Hicks family, and specifically two brothers, Jacob Middog Hicks and John Middog Hicks. Um, okay, so first of all, why are these brothers significant? Um, so Sarah Middog, who was a close relation on the mother's side, was deeply connected with St. Anne's Church. Um, her interests and labors on behalf of the church were very extensive. Um, for example, even at age 89, she still attended public worship um, and she ensured that more than 20 enslaved persons were baptized at the church and received their religious instruction. Um, second of all, it is very, very likely that the brothers themselves were members of St. Anne's Church. Um, and even if they themselves weren't, their spouses definitely were. Um, the St. Anne's Registry actually mentions multiple Mrs. Hicks uh, who are members or communicants of the church. Um, and finally, um, a slight tangent, but this family actually provides very interesting insight into the contention over slavery in the early 1800s. Um, so half of the Hicks family were slave owners, um, but the other half, um, actually the Quaker half, uh, is reported to have had abolitionist leanings. Um, so this actually led to like a whole family rift um, and their eventual split in 1827, um, which I could say a lot about, but I'll leave that out for now. Um, okay, so for some background, uh, Jacob M. Hicks, um, who was actually known affectionately as Spitter Hicks, 
uh, because he was apparently constantly spitting. Um, he owned one slave named Peter in 1777, three slaves in 1790, seven in 1800, and four in 1810. Um, and John Middog Hicks, um, who was known as Milk Hicks um, because he sold milk, um, he owned one slave in 1790 and one in 1810. Um, and the brothers were made of um, old Dutch stock. So their middle name, Middog, was their mother's maiden name. Um, and they inherited a large portion of the original Middog estate through their mother. Um, and so they owned waterfront property between Red Hook and the Wallabout, uh, which is northeast of Fort Greene Park. Um, and they also owned a large portion of land in Brooklyn Heights. Um, and the brothers were not interested in selling at all. Um, actually, they're quoted as being, quote unquote, averse to change or improvement. Um, so how did they live? This was a big question that I pursued in my research um, because personally, I just, I find it really fascinating um, to learn about like the day-to-day -day lives of people who lived just about 200 years ago um, in the same neighborhood where we all attend school today. Um, so I have extensive information on like where they lived, who their neighbors were, um, even what their gardens looked like, um, but I selected just a few highlights. Um, and as I read out a few quotes, um, I would like to point out um, or just remind you all that the luxurious lives of these brothers were made possible by slave labor. Um, so first of all, because of the inheritance from their mother, um, the Hicks brothers were exempted from the necessity of work and they passed their lives in a quote, quiet, leisurely manner, which gained for them from their less fortunate neighbors, the appellation of the gentleman, gentleman Hicks, end quote. Um, so Jacob M. Hicks lived in a large mansion, quote, on the wide front stoop of which he could often be seen sitting and enjoying the grateful shade of the venerable willows, looking placidly upon the passing travel, little dreaming perhaps of the improvements which were soon to change the entire aspect of the farm, end quote. Um, and for one final description, um, I've chosen a quote that was particularly affecting to me. Um, okay, so quote, from this elevated plateau, which was the Hicks estate, um, the eye rested upon a panoramic scene of unsurpassed beauty. The brothers resided upon their respective farms in a state of semi-seclusion, almost prophetic of that social aristocracy, which has since claimed the Heights as exclusively its own. Um, so as someone who attends school in Brooklyn Heights, um, this quote was particularly poignant to me. Um, I think it highlights the patterns throughout history um, and just the relevance of this family and this research to our own lives. Thank you. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, next up, Claire. Hi, I'm Claire. Um, uh, you're going to see me twice today but I'm just briefly popping in to sort of extrapolate actually on things that have been, um, that were just said by Jolene and also by Bevan and also a little bit of a collagile. So um, among researching, researching individual members and communicants of the church, uh, we became really curious about the documentation of the actual people who were enslaved in these households. Um, because most often it's just a number on the census data. Um, and we wanted to explore really if we could find anything about their lives. Um, and so the biggest piece of information that we found was this entry in the St. Anne's registry, which Craig will share with you in a second, <laughs> um, cataloging the marriage of two people enslaved by members of the church. Their names were Phyllis and Philip, and one of them came from the Aquila Giles household. I don't remember which one, um, but they were enslaved by two separate families um, that were members of the church. And we immediately had a lot of questions about how their marriage was recognized, if it was recognized outside of the church, if they lived together, what their lives were like, um, if they could be separated, if they had children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and immediately we, learned that we could not um, answer any of these questions um, because in this non-digital preliminary history age, documentation was everything. Um, and I think that the fact that we couldn't find anything about Phyllis and Phillips or 
any enslaved person's lives speaks volumes about who was deemed valuable and worthy of documentation um, and about the selective narrative that the North slash um, New York had created around and has created um, around slavery in this region. Um, and this just spoke to me as another way in which Black people were dehumanized in our society and deprived of any um, paper footprint or acknowledgments of their existence. Um, and so I'm just popping in to give that um, perspective as we learn this very well-documented history um, of the actual communicants. Thank you, Claire. And now we're going to go to Luca. Uh, okay. All right, Luca, you ready? Let me get your screen share, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Luca, and I'm doing my uh, presentation on the skimmer horns. So, uh, for again, they're up. They were a, uh, some of their family history. They were um, they were a very prominent family. They were one of the most more prominent Anglo-Dutch families in New York history, and they have a, a major street named after them in Brooklyn Heights. So, one of the first skimmer horns in America, Arnout Skimmerhorn, and his son John are both listed in the John Jay College database of New York state slaveholders as investors in the slave trade from 1725 to 1820. Peter Skimmerhorn, like his father and grandfather, was a commander and owner of shipping vessels trading between New York City and the Carolinas. Peter brought 92 slaves to North and South Carolina over nine different voyages between 1771 and 1774. And between 1725 and 1820, three generations of skimmer horns made 123 voyages and brought four, 453 slaves to the Carolinas, with anywhere from one to 33 slaves being carried on each voyage. At the end of the slave trade in 1827, the family moved into land development in 1820. In 1820. So, and then just some background on the uh, the end of the uh, slave trade because they they could they could see slavery was about to end, so they ended up moving to land development, and um, they bought um, they owned a lot of property by what is now Gowanus, and they sold some of it, and they also built houses on a lot of it, and uh, just some background on on uh, when on how they could uh, see that slavery was ending in NYC you know, around 1795. That was the first time the number of free blacks were greater than the number of enslaved blacks. On the other hand, in Kings County, this didn't happen until 1820, where there are more enslaved people than NYC. And then next we're gonna have some gra graphs to show this data. But keep in mind that the term free blacks is problematic because many of these people still had, a, there are still ways around. It was a very flimsy law at this point and there are still ways around it. So these are just some of the graphs. And uh, so um, the, uh, the black is uh, free and uh, the red is um, enslaved. And as you can see here, around uh, where they crossed around 1795 that's the first time it was uh, more more free than enslaved and it just goes up very very rapidly and then and next we have yeah kings county where it takes a lot longer it's still a uh, it's still a steady it's a and it's more a steady yeah. Uh, great. Thank you, Luca. You're welcome. All right. And uh, we'll go to Jacob next. Hi, I'm Jacob. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about another slave owner from the time period, uh, Tunis Duralman, but also about a more symbolic legacy of slave owning in Brooklyn Heights and in the neighborhood of the St. Louis Church. I think Jolene touched on the economic legacy. It's our banks, kind of our churches, most of them. And um, there's also the symbolic legacy of slavery 
in the street names, as you've heard, Schmimmerhorn, Drowman, like we've been talking about, Bergen, Paul Hemus, Sackett, it really just goes on and on. Jolene made a really good map that maybe we can share. Uh, but Tunis Drowman, who was born in 1766 and died in 1841, was a harness and saddle maker, and he lived in New Jersey, then Flatbush, but then in 1803, he purchased land from the Living Thing estate section in Brooklyn Heights um, and became a very prominent landowner, slaveholder, and also a member then an elder at the Reformed Church, uh, not the Sanus Church, but there he aligned himself with a swath of prominent Brooklyn denizens, including many, many slave owners who are, a lot of them, memorialized in street names. The Remsons, the Lefferts, one of the largest slaveholding families in Kings County, uh, the Bergens, Paul Hemus, okay. Um, Drowman himself, Tunis Drowman, owned one slave during the 1800 census. Uh, and in 1806, Maria, who he enslaved, got married by John Ireland, the Reverend of the St. Anne's Church. Um, so according to this book, A History of the City of Brooklyn and Kings County by Stephen M. Ostrander, it's one of the sources we used. There's also Henry Stiles, these old, like 100 years old history books about Brooklyn's history. Uh, so he writes, the Joralman filled the offices of justice of the peace and trustee and other offices, but was of a temperament antipodal to that of Pierpont, hotly opposing new streets, especially through his own property, and is scorning the distinction of having Joralman Street named after him. So Clinton Street cut straight through his property after, you know, he fought it for a long time, but Joralman also hated Clinton Street's namesake, the governor, DeWitt Clinton, who was responsible for the Erie Canal. Um, and he referred to Clinton's legacy as his big ditch. As for Duralman's own legacy, he now is memorialized in Duralman's street. Um, one of these many Brooklyn streets, in fact, a whole borough is lined with the names of slave owners. Um, despite many changes in the municipal rule of the city, um, and also especially in the wealthier and whiter neighborhoods, these streets have never been renamed um, or co-named like a lot of streets are now. Um, and so I think it's interesting to look at what streets are renamed throughout the history of Brooklyn and do those past reasons for renaming streets set a precedent that, a precedent that allows us or compels us to stop elevating the legacies of slave owners in Brooklyn street names. Um, and the history also reveals which zeitgeist and events were powerful enough to, you know, for, to make the city change its own landmarks. So some early examples are when the British took over from the Dutch and they were the city of a lot of the Dutch names and anglicized other ones like Boswick became Bushwick and that kind of stuff. The American Revolution saw the erasure of many loyalist names to be replaced by war heroes and revolutionaries. And when the Germans were the enemy in the First World War and sauerkraut was replaced with Liberty Cabbage, we changed Vienna Street to Lorraine and Dresden to Highland Place. So Brooklyn's oppressors and enemies or those perceived that way are often followed by their street names when ousted from the city. And so the prevalence of slave owner names among Brooklyn streets would seem to indicate that civilians uh, and the government do not know or do not care about the origins of these names or that the slave owner's legacies are still somehow considered valid. Um, at least, I mean, we can decide for ourselves after hearing more of the history of street name changes. The biggest wave of street name changes uh, occurred 150 years ago when the city of Brooklyn annexed, and it was a city at that point, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Bushwick, and it created this mess of like six different streets named Washington and eight different number four Washington Street addresses. Um, and they, after a long time, eventually came around to renumbering almost everything um, and changing a lot of names. Um, and that constitutes a lot of name changes that exist, but also so other examples in 1928, the Upper East Side's York Avenue was renamed to honor an American hero in the First World War, Sergeant Alvin York. I think we all know about uh, the Avenue of the Americas, which nobody uses, but which LaGuardia uh, had this rhetoric of renaming it in order to honor Pan-American ideals and principles and to better reflect the grandeur of the reconstructed Avenue. Um, after 9-11, many, many streets were renamed in honor of the victims and people who died and um, by now in all five boroughs, the number is almost 400 that have been named or co-named when you have a little name under the street um, in honor of these people. In 2015, two streets were co-named for police officers who were shot on duty. Um, and interestingly, this street renaming was fast-tracked. It originated from within the government from their respective council members. 
um, and it took a lot less time than usual. In a recent article about this like one man who championed many of the co-naming of the streets in Harlem, um, one journalist writes, getting a street renamed can take months if not years. Though the process varies slightly in each district, proposals generally require a petition signed by 100 or more community members, accompanied by a detailed biography of the individual to be honored, and a description of the person's relationship to that area. Materials are presented for a vote to the district's committee for overseeing street names, and then, if successful, are presented for a full board vote. If the board votes in favor, the proposal goes to city council and finally to the mayor. So this process takes dedication and hours of lobbying. But in 2006, Gary Dennis, a Humphrey Bogart fan, did just that and eventually saw the renaming of Bogart's childhood block to Humphrey Bogart Place. So we can conclude that Brooklyn streets in the 21st century are co-named when the demand is strong enough, whether it's an impassioned individual or the popular demand of a neighborhood. But the names and the name proposals are ratified and implemented much faster when they originate from within the government, especially after local or national tragedies. It is, for the government, a relatively costless symbolic act. So you have to wonder why are the names of slave owners still emblazoned across Brooklyn Heights specifically? Because other neighborhoods have changed them. Uh, historically, less white and wealthy neighborhoods like Williamsburg and Greenpoint, uh, they used to have two Wyckoff streets like we do. It's just, um, Tate has his own story, um, Wyckoff. But they renamed them Ten Eyck Street and Humboldt Street after people who did not own slaves. Um, one was the German explorer Alexander Humboldt, who was famous for deploring slavery. Um, Mauger Street in Greenpoint was originally named Branson Street, one of the uh, St. Anne's slave owners, after Abraham Branson. But on April 30th, 1937, the name was changed to Mauger Street for Daniel Mauger, um, who was an attorney. Um, so in the end, these street names may be, <clears throat> they may be inconsequential, but they are the tools we use to move around the city. They're not a list of values. But they also do not constitute a historical preservation, you know, like a bastion of historical preservation. So, um, yeah, I think that morally the slave owners' names should have been changed a long time ago, but we still can and should prevent future generations from walking and living under these names um, enshrined on placards and maps all across Brooklyn, um, and especially Brooklyn Heights, the names of slave owners. Thank you, Jacob. And we'll go back to Claire. Hi again. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of perspective on um, what our actual process um, looked like. So at the beginning of our research process in September, um, Craig would assign names from the parish directory to we each had a spreadsheet. Um, and that would either be a last name or a full name or a couple's name. Um, and we would have to piece together the identity of this person from that um, sole information of their name. Um, so their role in the church, their profession outside of it, when they joined, where they lived, and most importantly, their involvement um, in the institution of slavery, whether that was, were they enslaving people in their home? Were they abolitionists? Did they have any outward stance on slavery? That was actually one of our biggest questions at the beginning was, was there any, we obviously knew about um, coalitions and organizations um, for abolition in the city at this time. And we really wanted to know um, where our uh, members fell there. Um, and those were the questions that we tried and answered today. Um, and this was a challenging process filled with like a lot of ancestry.com um, and dead ends and unanswered questions. But um, I felt really lucky because my first name that I got on my spreadsheet was Joshua Sands. Um, and I felt lucky because to have such a well-documented and essential person um, as my entryway into this project. And I was able to find um, the details we were looking for relatively quickly. So Joshua Sands and his wife, Anne, moved from Long Island in some like town that doesn't, it doesn't have that name anymore, but, um, to Manhattan in the late 1770s. Um, and Joshua and his brother Comfort, um, his name was Comfort, sorry, <laughs> uh, formed a business partnership in foreign trade and land development. Um, and soon after they formed that partnership, they began to process, um, process prosper <laughs> uh, in the Caribbean trade. And everyone has been citing this um, quotes from this Styles book, so I will too. Um, there was Joshua Sands, tall and commanding, with the air of one whom no amount of business could perplex. 
Um, so the Caribbean is one of the earliest sites of colonialism in the Americas um, and became a primary site for the exploitation of sugarcane, petroleum, tobacco, fruit, alcohol, and gold, all highly profitable um, items in the US. Uh, and this system is a direct product of the transatlantic slave trade and slave labor, capitalism, and colonialism. Um, and these profits from this business were what funded Sands and his family's wealth, which eventually um, aided in the founding of this church and were quite essential in that. Um, so immediately I began to, after working with the census data, um, which was just numbers and names, I began to zoom out and we all began to zoom out to understand the broader connection um, that these members had to the institution of slavery. Um, and that was a pretty like profound zoom. <laughs> and so after something happened with his trade business with his brother and he moved into real estate development from his profits from that, um, the trade industry, and he moved his business to Brooklyn and he purchased 160 acres of land along the Brooklyn waterfront, basically spanning from modern day Wegmans <laughs> to the Brooklyn ice cream factory. Um, and in the middle of that, in the Dumbo area, he built a three-story federal style mansion um, that has now been destroyed and changed into something else. Um, but in this home, he enslaved six people, um, and that was often a place of gathering for St. Anne's. So St. Anne's was incorporated in 1787 as the Episcopal Church of Brooklyn, and Joshua and his wife joined in 1788. Um, Joshua was cited as a founding member of the vestry and board and a significant financial donor to the church's establishment and hosted weekly gatherings in their home. And the Sam's family eventually offered the plot of land off their farm that the church um, used to erect its first edifice. So after that um, land donation in 1795, the church was reorganized and reincorporated with that established location. Um, and because of this position that the Sands family held with the church, Joshua and the collective congregation decided to rename the church as well. And the community decided to honor his wife, Anne Sands, for her contribution to the church's founding by naming it St. Anne's Church. So I had assumed I've been, I'm a senior and I've been at St. Anne's since I was three. Um, and I have always assumed that the Anne and St. Anne's um, was referring to um, Mary's mother, the maternal grandmother of Jesus, and that is Anne with an E. Um, and so when I found this information on like my first day of um, research, I processed sort of in at a desk that this church and effectively our school were not named with Anne with an E, the saint, um, but for someone who is not only complicit in the institution of slavery, a beneficiary of it, and also someone who enslaved people in their home consistently um, throughout this church's establishment. Um, so that is sort of an overarching, intense um, detail that we felt was really important to share with you. And I'm really happy to share it with you now because we have been sitting with it since September and it has been just like the street names, um, although holding a little bit more gravity, uh, a really intense thing to process, so. Thank you, Claire. And that, um, that concludes our series of formal presentations. And I would be happy to uh, answer any questions. Um, I think first I would like to go back though and uh, share, not this, uh, but um, if I can, our map. And again, say that, you know, what, this will be a repository of information, but you can see each of these red lines are the streets that we have been talking about uh, that are named um, Skimmerhorn Street, Middaw Street, Drolleman Street, um, Hicks Street, Furman Street, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the docks area down here, um, we know of at least two parishioners who were significant owners of, owners of warehouses 
um, in those docks that housed uh, cotton, sugar, tobacco, et cetera, for shipping uh, into the national and international trade. Um, but as you roll around, you know, down here in Red Hook, we've got a couple, and eventually we'll start highlight some more um, some more streets. But that's that has been uh, one of the profound findings was this realization, um, not only that all of these streets are named for slave owners, but the remarkable fact that so many of them, their families were members of St. Anne's Church um, in its earliest years, and that hence the the names of our congregation, of our congregation members, um, carry on this legacy that is quite mixed of both founding a church, but also uh, being involved in uh, the business and of slavery and of literally owning people themselves. I do want to say thank you again, uh, Craig, and all of you wonderful young people. It really is truly, a, it's a great benefit to the church, and we're profoundly grateful to you for, for your energy and effort. And and for the integrity and passion with which you've taken this on, it means a great deal. I saw Father Craig beaming while each of you presented, so I know <laughs> it means a lot to him too. But thank you so, so much. And my thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I think on that note, uh, we'll say conversation to be continued. Take care, all. <laughs>